everyone. Uh, once again, we are here for a new webinar for Latin America, LAOC, Latin American Oracle User Group Community, and to NZOG, New Zealand Oracle User Group. And I have right now with us Mr. Arup Nanda. Uh, he is going to uh, do this webinar from uh, India at the moment. For him, it's, it's 3 o'clock or 3.30 in the morning. And thank you, Arup, for uh, all the efforts. And one more time, the Oracle community around the world uh, say thank you for all your efforts. And OK, Arup, I'm giving to you the control of the presentation. Now it's all yours, Arup. All right. Thank you very much, Francisco. Let me uh, share my screen first after I got, yep, so my screen. Can you see that, Francisco, my screen? Yes, Arup, is, okay. I can see your screen now. Uh, I can see your screen. Great. Uh, thank you very much for all of attending the webcast. I appreciate your time. Hope you can get something out of it. Um, uh, we will talk about today under the hoods of CAS Fusion, Global NQ Services, Global Resource Directory, and Global CAS Services. My name is Arup Nanda. I'm the principal database architect at Starwood Hotels. And uh, one of my jobs is to design and strategy for the future direction of the company as far as database is concerned. But I'm also a DBA like most of you probably are. I am a very hands-on DBA. I resolve the problems as well. And uh, today we'll talk about CAS Fusion. Um, let's see, uh, to move to the next slide. Uh, uh, well, about me, I have an Oracle database administrator for almost more than 16 years and surviving. I have been using Rack and OPS since 1999. I do troubleshooting and tuning performance, particularly in reference to Rack. And, um, I developed and teach a course called uh, Rack Performance Tuning. It's a two-day course, complete two-day course. Uh, I teach uh, around the world, uh, many, in various parts of the world. Um, why this session? This is something I have found repeatedly that people don't understand, or people have a little bit of uh, clarity, a black black clarity to understand things which is very important to Rack. For example, Cas Fusion is one, one of the very important parts of Rack. But I think many people are not very clear about exactly how the CAS fusion actually works and what actually causes it and all that thing. For example, this is a simple example. Um, if I have a 100 meg database, exactly 100 meg, I can have a 100 meg buffer cache and I can, I can never, I, I don't have to go, to back, go back to disk at all. I can put my entire database into the memory. Is that correct? Well, the answer is no. But then why is that the case though? If I have a 100 meg database and 100 meg buffer cache, I should be able to fit everything into the buffer cache. Why shouldn't I be? What is the reason for that? How does CAS Fusion know where to get the block from? Let's say there are multiple instances, not just two. First of all, should it go for the block? Should it go to the desk? Should it go to the buffer cache of another instance? How does it know? Then there are other, a lot of acronyms uh, running around, uh, Global CAS Services, GCS, Global Resource Directory, GRD, and Global NQ Services. What are those things exactly? How do they actually perform? Uh, we will understand all this and how they actually work together and how they're important for RAC. Why is that important? It's important because if you do not understand exactly how they work, you'll never be able to understand how to do the tuning part of it. So that's the very the most critical part of the, of the of to understand exactly how this different components play together in order to tune them properly. All right, let's next the next one. Let's understand the concept of buffer cache. I have system global area, SGA, and part of that is a buffer cache. And I have my certain uh, uh, the, the, let's say I have a table with exactly two blocks. Which actually is not going to be two blocks; it'll be more than two. But let's say exactly two blocks in the database file. Is uh, when a session does select star from EMP as a table name, or to create something called a server process on the behalf of the, of the user, and then the server process gets the data from the block, from the table block in the on the desk to the table on the buffer cache, and then return the data 
back to the user using the server process. That's always the case. Oracle never gets data directly from the disk to the end user. Kind of makes sense. All right, so that's the concept of buffer cache. Why? Because when another user selects from the same table, then Oracle doesn't have to go to the disk all the time. It can go to the buffer cache and get it. So it's a very simple concept. We have understood that from the beginning itself. It becomes a little complicated. In Rack, there are more than one buffer cache, but there are more than one instance. Let's for simplicity's sake, let's assume there are only two instances. All right, there are at least two buffer caches. So when you say select star from AMP, from let's say instance number two, at that time, the server process knows that, hey, this block is not found in the buffer cache of the local instance, but it is found on the other side. So instead of going to the disk, it can go to the other side and get the, the, the block from the other instance's buffer cache. And that's what happens. This process is known as cache fusion, that they're moving the data from other side to uh, from other instance to this instance instead of going to the disk. So that's the kind of cache fusion. Now the question comes in. Well, when the buffer when a block is requested, the buffer cache is initially searched, has to be. If it's not found, well, if it's found, great. Uh, so the, let's say it's not found. There are two options, get from the desk or get from the other cache, right? If it is found, there are three options. Well, first is that get, if it is found, well, it's found, send it out, out to the end user. Or option number two, examine the other caches if there is the, this buffer is present anywhere else. Or third option, get from the desk. So it becomes complicated, as you know. So how does it know which option to choose from? This is, this is, not, this is not a trivial question. This is a very important question. Because based on that, the performance as well as the, the currency of the data is going to be important. So if it is found, it still has to decide whether to send it out or uh, if it's, I'm sorry, if it's not found, it still has to decide. So they go to the disk to get it or go to the other cache to check for it. If it is found, there are still three options. Send the buffer to the end user or examine the other buffer caches or get from the disk. How does it decide to do all that? That's the concept of today we're going to discuss. To understand that, this another concept that you need to understand is a buffer state. When a user requests the buffer, by the way, let's understand the word buffer and blocks in the context. Block is something that the minimum amount of storage Oracle could have on the desk. In the buffer cache, you create a buffer, number of buffers. Those blocks come from the desk into the buffer cache. Think of a mailbox, a lot of mailboxes of exactly similar size in one side. So when something comes from, from the, from the blood, blood desk into one of those mailboxes, they go fit into those uh, buffer state. So when the block comes from the desk into the buffer cache, we call that a buffer. Why we call that a buffer? Because at that point, the block could exist on many different buffers. Let me repeat that. A block could uh, exist on different buffers. That means there could be multiple copies of the same block in the buffer cache. <laughs> Why multiple copies? Excuse me. Why multiple copies? This is very important to understand. That. There, there will be multiple copies of the buffer on the buffer in the, in the buffer cache. So let's understand that. So to understand that, we have to understand that the buffer state. When there are two states, consistent read state and current state. There can be several copies of a state. The, there can be multiple CR copies of the buffer. But there can be only one current copy of the buffer. For an instance, each current state is called a shared current. A shared current means there can be one single shared current per instance. But there's something else called exclusive current copy. An exclusive current copy can be only one exclusive current copy across the entire cluster. 
So what are the different things? And what exactly is CR copy? What's the current copy? To do that, let's first understand that. If somebody, if a cessation lacks something just for selecting it, not with an intention of updating it, that kind of copy is retrieved as CR copy. If something is retrieved in, uh, for the purpose of updating it, then that copy will be called a current copy. Let me repeat. If the session gets the data from the block into the buffer gas, just for selecting it, not for intention of modifying it, the, the buffer state that time is called CR, consistent rate. If the intention is to update it, for example, update table or select for update or delete or something like that, then it becomes a current copy. So that obviously there has to be only one or there can be multiple CR copies because the intention is just to modify it and uh, but can be only one current mode. And we'll see exactly how the mode state and how that, that mode is different from other ones. To understand that, let's see the block and row relationships. As you know, Oracle stores the minimum amount of data in the database as a block. So a single block may contain more than one row, much more than one row maybe, or certainly depending on the row size itself. All of maybe exactly one row, but mostly more than one row. So let's say I have a specific block in the database side. I have two instances on this instance one and instance two. Now what happens if I blow up this AWS block, I would see that there is actually four rows in this block. This is blow it up, row one, two, three, and four. Now somebody does this one, update row one. Remember, update row one. When update row one happens on instance one, what happens? Well, the first thing that it does is it gets the entire block from the database into the instance. Even though you're updating row one, Oracle has to go and grab the entire block into, into the, the buffer cache at that time. And then it updates row one. So at this time, I can see row one is different. So the copy of the block on instance one is actually different from that on the, on the disk. This is very cri critical. So the copy of the Bob block on, in the instances of gas is different from that in the, blood, the database itself. Now, let's say somebody does this one. Update row two. This is pretty important. It's not updating row one. It's updating row two on instance two. At that time, as you know, it will get the cast fusion from, from it will get to grab the block, actually, sorry, the buffer from instance one. So what will happen via the cache fusion, it gets a copy of the block from here. Naturally, when the copy comes over there, it's still row one has been changed over there. Then once it gets it, Oracle updates the row two on this. Now as you can see here, there are two copies of the same block. One copy each on instance one and in two. And these two copies are different because on instance two, the copy has a row two updated, which is different from row, row instance one's copy. But this is, the, this is exactly where the problem comes in. How does it know? How does it know that then which, which one is the correct version? To do that, Oracle identifies something called buffer versions. On the database, let's say the SCN number was 10 when the block was first uh, retrieved. After the block was updated on instance one, SCN number was 20. So the version one of the buffer was SCN number 20. On instance two, let's say the SCN number was 30 when the row two was updated. So copy there on the version, second version of it, and the SCN number was 30. So that's exactly how Oracle identifies which one is the most current copy of the version block by doing so. But that's not it though. If, let's say at this time, instance one wants to go and, and update something, should it go and update its own copy? Probably not. Why? Because that copy will not be current. We have to go and grab the most current copy from instance two. So to do that for persons, what uh, instance one does it, it moves out and gets the copy from instance two into instance three to update row number three here. 
Now you can see there are two copies of the same buffer on instance one, not one copy. There is with one version with SCN number 20, the other one with SCN number 40. And on instance two, we have one copy with SCN number 30. So let's start with that further. First we started with row one on a copy with instance one. Then instance two wanted to modify a different row. All of to do a different row, it has to go and grab the entire buffer from the buffer, from the buffer cache. So it got the buffer cache, instance one wanted to update another row, a third row, but on the same block. So it has to go and grab the buffer from instance two back into instance one, a different copy, and then update it there. Now, does it tell you something? In this case, instance from instance 10, it goes to instance 1. I have, I'm sorry, as far as goes to instance 1. At that time, we somehow have to make sure that this copy is, we know, somehow mark this copy as the most current copy at that time. And to do that, remember, I told you, when it gets, it selects the block with the intention to modify it. In this case, the intention was to modify it. It is done in a current mode. And that's why it is current. At that time, this copy of the buffer was single all across all instances, and that was called exclusive current at that time. When instance two wanted to modify that, it got that through cache fusion. At that time, <coughs> that exclusive current copy was converted into a CR copy and the exclusive current copy was granted to that on instance 2. Why is this important? It's important to know that this time that uh, across the entire cluster, the copy on instance 2 is the most current copy. So if any other instance wants to go and select from it, they have to go to the exclusive current copy and select from there. If they want to update it, they have to get the copy and make that copy the exclusive current copy and instance 2 will have to relinquish that. So in this case, something happens. If the update row 3 happened on, on instance 1, the exclusive current copy comes back to instance 1 and the instance 2 copy becomes consistent trait. Unless the buffer is, get, uh, is retrieved in the exclusive current copy, the instance is not allowed to modify it, which is very important. What? Why? Why is that important? Why? Why? Is, why should the instance be concerned about getting the SF current copy? Think about it for a moment. If it did not do that, what would prevent <laughs> instance one to modify the SCN number twenty copy of it? Without that, it could modify SCN number twenty. And now there will be discrepancy. Now there will be update on row 1 and row 3 on SC number 20 copy. And on, on, on the instance 2 side, SC number 3rd of row 1 and row 2 are modified. <coughs> Excuse me. So that to prevent that, Oracle has to make sure that it grabs the exclusive current copy and only update on the exclusive current copy and not anything else, which is very, very important. And to do that, it has to get something called a lock. Lock on the entire buffer. So this lock on the entire buffer is called a buffer lock, which is different from the row lock here. As you can see here, the instance one has a buffer lock on this case. In this, in this specific slide, on and the on the SCN number 40 copy of the buffer. It doesn't have a lock on the SCN number 20 copy of the buffer. Similarly, instance 2 doesn't have a lock at all. It has a consistent rate and has lock on instance on, on the SCN number 30 copy of the buffer it only has. By the way, remember it used to have the exclusive current lock on the buffer earlier. It was converted back into consistent rate. That concept is called a lock downgrading. And similarly, on the instance one side, it actually uh, it upgrades the lock from consistent rate to exclusive current. So on instance one, it it got an, a lock upgrade. On instance two, it went through a lock downgrade. 
remember this locking has nothing to do with the row level locking which is happening in row 1, 2, 3, which is different from the buffer level locking. So some people are confused a little bit about locking on the buffer level at the row level. So I hope this picture makes it clear. <coughs> Excuse me. So putting it all together. <coughs> when the buff block comes from the disk to the buffer gas, if the intention is to modify, it is retrieved in a current mode. If the intent is to read only, it is, it is retrieved in CR mode. There can be only one shared current per instance. What is shared current by the way? When it first get it, obviously this at that time is most current, but at that time it's actually same across all the instances. So it doesn't make a difference to make it exclusive at the time. It could be shared current. So but it can be only one shared current, for instance, across all the whole clusters. But it can be only one exclusive current because exclusive current means that of that buffer may have been updated and that's the most recent copy of the buffer. If somebody wants to modify that, then they have to make that exclusive current copy and up to modify that. So then the, the, simply the ownership of the, of the most current block comes to that instance. All right, so another, another concept here called past image. So here's a sequence of events. Instance 1 has version 1 of the block. Instance 2 has version 2 of the block. Let's say, think about it. Instance 1 has version 1. Instance 2 has version 2. Instance 2 updates the block. At that time, instance 2 gets the exclusive current copy of the block. Remember that? Now, Instance 1, <coughs> excuse me, wants to update the block. Remember, Instance 2 has already updated the block, but Instance 1 wants to update the block. At that time, as you saw before, it should get the, the Instance 1 at the, I'm sorry, uh, Instance 2 at the time, so downgrade it from exclusive current to CR copy, as you saw before. And uh, Instance 1 obviously will get the exclusive current copy of it. But here's the problem though. Problem is, let's say at this time, after instance one uh, gets the exclusive current copy of it, and this, let me show the picture over here, which might be helpful. At this time, instance two is downgraded <laughs> into a consistent read copy, and instance one gets the exclusive current copy. Well, that's clear. Let's say at this time, instance one crashes. What should happen? Well, it's not a huge problem because instance 2 can do the instance recovery using redo threads and all that. But look at the problem here. The copy of the buffer it has in memory will be called consistent read. The definition of consistent read is very simple. That means this copy of the buffer was retrieved for the intention of reading from it or simply selecting from it, not for the intention of updating it. So that means Technically speaking, it has not been updated, right? But no, it has been updated. Because row, row 2, <coughs> excuse me, row 2 was actually updated on instance 2. So, what will happen is, Oracle instance recovery will bypass this buffer. It will get some old copy of the buffer, read from the redo log, and roll forward from that point. Whereas it could have done a very simple task of getting the buffer in the buffer cache for instance two and applying the redo to that sort of the buffer, not not everything else, and would have done a much faster instance recovery. But it can do that because the copy is called CR copy. That's why it would only simply bypass it. To avoid the problem, what Oracle does it instead of sending from making the copy a CR copy on instance two it makes it something called a past image copy and then sends it across to instance 1 and the past image is stored until the checkpoint happens. Why? Because when the checkpoint happens, well at that time the, the block on the disk is exactly similar to block buffer on the buffer cache. So there is no reason to do any instance recovery anymore. At that time it becomes CR copy. But until the checkpoint happens, the buffer is made not consistent read on instance 2. It is made a PI copy, past image copy. That way, Oracle can actually, uh, actually can 
use that for instance recovery purposes and not some old copy of the box so it recovers faster. That's the concept of PI copy or a past image copy. There is one important note. Interestingly, PI is not documented at all in Oracle manuals. It's just widely understood and acceptable. So it, if you are searching for Oracle manuals right now, or if you do in the future, please understand that it, for some reason it's not documented. But that's the concept of PI copy. You can certainly find it out from $3BH if you want to find out. You can see the PI copy there as well. So it's not, um, I'm not making it up. Okay, so let's see how CAS Fusion actually works, by the way. So we'll see that. Let's say I have three sessions, three instances, three sessions. Each session connects to one instance, and one, two, three, instance one, instance two, three. Time T0, there's a two block table on the database side. Time T0, instance has just come up. That means, technically speaking, the buffer cache is completely empty. At least there is no copy of the, the table we are talking about in any of the buffer cache of any um, of the, any of the instances of the database. Somebody does this way: select star from T1, the table. When you do that, at the time, the block goes from the database into the buffer cache. And that's called that to instance one buffer cache. This is a, this is something session one does and session one select from T1. Okay. At the time, the buffer state is known as shared current. Why shared current? Because at that time, that's the most current copy of the buffer. Well, it makes make sense. Why shared current? Because I'm on the buffer state here this time it will be similar to any of the other instances as well. So it's not going to be different in any of the other instances. So it can be only one copy of the buffer that is shared, that is called shared current. It could be another instance doing the same thing, say start from T1. It will also be a shared current at time, but they'll be all similar to shared current. At that time, instance uh, session 2 connected to instance 2 does same thing, select start from T1. At the time, it doesn't get to go to the disk and get it, right? At the time, it gets from instance 1 via a cache fusion. But at the time, his buffer state is CR. Why CR? So the intention was to select from it, not to modify. To select that from TR. So copy is CR. So set current on the instance 1, CR on instance 2. And finally, <coughs> session 3 on instance 3 does update just to throw monkey wrench in the system. Update T1. When update T1 happens, remember that time the intention is to update the buffer. So at that time, it gets the same thing, CR copy into instance 3, but it has to make an exclusive lock on the buffer because at that time, instance 3 will have to modify the buffer. And that, that exclusive copy, uh, the buffer state is called exclusive current or X card. When it becomes exclusive current, one of the interesting thing happens. Remember it used to be shared current earlier on instance one, but uh, because it's exclusive current, there can be only one exclusive current in the entire cluster. And if that is the case, there cannot be any more shared currents on the entire cluster. So the exclusive current, the shared current copy uh, which existed on instance one will have to be now downgraded into a CR copy. So two things happen. The buffer which we retrieved from instance two initially in the CR copy is upgraded to a specific current on instance three and the buffer on <coughs> instance one which used to be said current now downgraded into CR. So now you have a CR copy on instance one, CR copy in instance two, exclusive current copy on instance three. Now, now let <coughs> I do some a session one on instance one does something else. Update T one. When that happens, it gets the copy from instance three, obviously at the time. But remember, the intention is to modify it. So it has to go and grab the exclusive current lock of that. Remember, 
So the buffer state is now upgraded from CR into exclusive current. And on instance 3, because it has been not been written to the disk yet, it has been sent out without being written to the disk, it's called, it, at that time we create something called a PI copy of it and send the PI copy across to the other instance and from there it will become exclusive current. So at the time, buffer state exclusive current instance 1, instance 2 is still CR because nothing is happening on that and instance 3 was PI copy of it. And yeah, copy it. And then after some time, the checkpoint happens, alter system checkpoint. At the time the past image is gone, it becomes CR copy on instance 3. This is the life cycle of a buffer. And by the way, as you know, alter system checkpoint writes the, of the buffer state back into the disk. So the list, now the, disk, the block initially is carried at the, in, the, in the database side, then it goes back to instance 1, from there it went to instance 2, from there it went to instance 3, got updated, then instance 1 updated that, so got went from instance 3 back into instance 1, the alter system checkpoint happens, the written from instance 3 back into the database side. So now life cycle is kind of complete. <coughs> Although at this stage, the buffer copies are different because each update <coughs> because each update excuse me, uh, each update actually happen at different times at different SCN numbers. So it actually uh, the versions are different. But I think I understand the concept. <coughs> Sorry, I'm just a little sick. Um, excuse me. Um, so you have, at, at, the, at different times, the exclusive current copy and the CR copy are different, as you can see here. Don't worry about all that. Actually, I will uh, better use an example. But I, ho <coughs> I hope you got the concept pretty clear. The concept of exclusive current copy, CR copy, and the PI copy. And one more thing here is, Alter system checkpoint is important. Is it important to do the checkpoint on insertion in instance three only, or is it important? Or does it, or does it matter uh, if I do in any checkpoint anywhere? Will that be a problem? What happens is if I do an instance of a checkpoint on session instance one at this time, it writes back the most recent copy of the buffer ever uh, across all the all the cluster instances back into the database side. So at the time, even though the copy on instance 3 is different, it actually doesn't matter because that copy is older anyway from the most current copy on instance 1. So if I do a checkpoint on instance 1, the PI copy on instance 3 will be updated to CR copy because at the time that copy is not relevant anymore. The instance recovery is now going to um, use that because so you have so the database has the most recent copy of it. That's the concept here. Yeah. So buffer log. On instance wants to change the state of the buffer from CR to exclusive current or a, or a sad current, it must get a lock. If it doesn't get a lock, then one instance could update something which the other instance will not uh, know about. So when the other instance wants to update it, it will update its own copy and now there will be an inconsistent copy across all the instances. So to prevent that, Oracle must get a lock on the entire buffer <coughs> to update it. So, in this example we saw earlier, uh, we have two sessions uh, on two instances, session 1, session 2. As you can see here, row 1 and row 3 are updated by session 1, or maybe we have different which, uh, but uh, the buffer lock on instance 1 is exclusive, instance 2 has no buffer lock on the buffer. And row locks, however, Session 1 has row 1 and 3, session 2 which is row 2 on a different one. And how exactly is the row lock removed or, 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 or expired when the session commits or rolls back? The row lock is gone. The row lock is not gone until the session, I'm sorry, not until the instance checkpoints. When the checkpoint happens, at that time, the lock may not be relevant anymore, but until that actually happens or the block is completely flushed out of the memory, only then the lock is gone. Without that, the lock is never gone. So think of this, remember this, the row locking has no relationship whatsoever 
to the buffer logger. The row locking is there to make sure the two sessions don't update the same row at the same time and they get the consistent until the commit actually happens. The buffer lock is done by an instance and the instance simply wants to update something and then it has to get an upper buffer lock. Okay, so provides the global CAS service. So now you understand that someone has to move around this block from one instance to other instance. And that service is called a global cache service. It provides a buffer from one instance to the other instance we have requested. But GCS, the global cache service, it can do the transpose, but it doesn't know who has what type of buffer lock. Remember in this case, instance 2, if you want to update the buffer, it doesn't matter which row it, the buffer is updated, it has to go and grab the other other server on the other side and the other side has to downgrade the buffer lock and instance 2 has to upgrade the buffer lock. When that happens, it doesn't know, the GCS doesn't know who has the lock and who, who doesn't have lock and all that. To do that, we have another concept called global NQ service, which used to be called earlier dynamic lock manager in Oracle 9.9, DLM. So we still use the word a little bit interchangeably, DLM and global NQ service. It holds information on the locks in the buffer. Each lock has a name, as you can actually is visible through a view called V dollar lock element, or the X dollar view on that, which is a as you know X dollar view on memory, and it's called X dollar LE. By the way, this is different from row locking, which is on a specific row. If you can know that, if a buffer is locked, you can see the lock element name in V dollar BH dot lock element lock queuing. So naturally now we have a concept of a buffer lock. We have to see how we can use a buffer lock. Each buffer in the rack instance, by the way, it's called a resource. It has two queues, a grand queue and a convert queue. The grand queue where all the requests are queued up. And the convert queue, when the request is satisfied, they're put into convert queue. For example, in the first I remember, instance one requested the exclusive current copy of the buffer. It went into first grant queue. Once the request is satisfied, that means that the instance was granted the lock, I mean the buffer lock, exclusive current buffer lock of the buffer, it has moved into convert queue. So then somebody else was requesting that. So when that happens, then instance one has to relinquish that. That means it's been downgraded to that. And once the downgrade is complete, then the other instance gets the exclusive current copy of it. Then it goes back into the convert queue from the grand queue and so on and so forth. So there's a queue mechanism in this case. It has to be. As you can see here, the queue mechanism has to be done in the memory. And is a little problem though. This problem is in a rack database there are multiple instances. That means there are multiple memory areas. And this, this locking mechanism, the queue mechanism, cannot be across multiple instances. It can be, but it has to be replicated, all the queue data. But replication of the queue data is going to be extremely expensive, and it's not feasible to do that, because it's not, no, it's not possible to do that in the very real time. And unless you have some kind of replication mechanism, it's going to be incorrect data. So, what Oracle does is, it puts the locking mechanism on this queue, convert queue on a grand queue of a specific buffer on only one instance, not multiple instances. And this instance that has the multiple instance is called a master instance of that buffer. So let's see what happens. A master instance of a buffer has information on which, which buffer, is, I'm sorry, on the, which instance has the exclusive current copy of that buffer and who, which other instances are waiting to get that. That's all. And the anybody else, any other instance was to go and, and ask for the upgrade or downgrade, they have to go to the master to, to get that thing done. The buffer has only one master. The master may change manually or by a process known as dynamic resource mastery. When an instance wants to get a lock, it has to go and check with the master. Well, it's a problem. Then someone has to keep a list of all the buffers and where the master is, right? Because remember, 
a buffer has only one master across. This information is called a global resource center or GRD. A GRD is present on all the instances of the cluster. But as we saw earlier, a GRD of instance 1 will probably be different. And I'm, I'm sorry, the locks on instance 1, um, uh, uh, lock uh, information on instance 1 will be different from lock information on instance 2. So GRD simply maintains one information. That means buffer number 1 is mastered on instance 1. Buffer number 2 is mastered on instance 2. Buffer number 3 is mastered on instance 3 and so on and so forth. That's all. So when somebody, and this information is of course replicated across all the three, all, all, all the instances of the cluster. To find out who the master is, you can use this query. Uh, by the way, don't worry about uh, writing down the query. I will have the, all the scripts I use in this demonstration as well on my website, on my blog. I will show that afterwards so you can download the whole script from there. So remember, GRD is something that is, uh, that is simply a, like a phone book that simply says that buffer number and, and who, which instance is the master information they can go to the master and get the locking information from there. But to just to know who the master is, they have to go and query the GRT. And GRT is the one that maintains this information. Okay. That being said, let's see a demonstration because that's the most critical part of this information. All right. So to demonstrate, I have two instances. Instance one and instance two. So let me show you instance one. Select instance name from $3 instance and it's called rack1 and uh, select uh, instance from $3 instance is rack2. Just to show the difference, I have actually used a different color for rack2 than rack1 just to show the difference how we to see that. All right, so then I will do this, set echo on, and I will set up a table, and I will use the table. So let me set up a table here, drop table CF test, I have a table called CF test, and then I would do this, uh, sorry about that, it did not drop the table. Okay, let me do it one more time. Okay. All right, let me show you what I'm doing here. What I'm doing here is I'm creating a table called CF test with column 1 as number and column 2 is character 2000. Important question. Column 2 is character 2000 and default X. Why character 2000? Because if I do a var care, then it's going to put exactly that many number of uh, characters. Uh, the size will be exactly that many number of characters I put there. If I put a care 2000, it's going to pad everything else after that up to 2000. And I'm trying to del deliberately trying to create a block with um, a row with a very long row. So in this case, I'm putting a care 2000, so the row is going to be 29 or some characters long. All right. Then um, table got created, and I'm inserting six rows into the table, as you can see. And and the rows will be pretty long because the cat 2000, and that's why the cat is there right now. And I did this on instance one. If I want to find out which blocks, how many blocks, and all that is going to populate, well, I can do that. I can do that from DB extends and uh, segment name is called the CF test. Select extend ID and block ID. I apologize, this is a VMware environment, so it's not the fastest one in the world. So I got the extend ID one extent, and it has exactly eight blocks, and the block ID starts with nine zero two three three. Why eight blocks? Well, does it completely fill up eight blocks? I have only six rows in this, and plus bytes, 
I am using a 8K block size. So it's still filled up uh, 8 blocks because that's the minimum extent size. That's why. And the block ID is 90233. So will my data start at 90233? No. The block ID 90233 is probably a segment header. That's the first one. The data might start somewhere else. Where is that somewhere else? How do I know that? I can know that by this information. I can do that using DBMS row ID dot row ID relative file number and the block number from CFTS. I can see that I populated two blocks, 90233 and 90235. I'm sorry, 234 and 235. So 90233, that block number was segment header probably, but the actual data they exist on 234 and 235. Three rows each. This is very important to understand that. So I have two blocks in this table with three rows on each block. Column one. So this is how I identify the row IDs, rows. Column one, two, and three, and four, five, and six. That's critical for us. Let's just know that. This is how I know that. All right. So when I do that, there's another important concept I have to understand is that the data object ID and the object ID. I have to know that. Remember, the data object ID is actually very important, not the object ID in what I'm going to show. In many cases, the data object ID and the object ID will be similar, so it will be exactly the same. There will be different in some cases, and that case is usually partition tables, so that's why the data object ID will be different from object ID. So let's see what the data object ID of this table is. So in this case, as you know, it's not a partition table, so it's exactly similar. 80489. So we have to remember that actually after one purpose. Okay, good. Now having done done on that, let's see in the buffer cache how many buffers I have from this table. And also what kind of state these buffers are. You do that. Our data object ID. So I let's see what I'm doing here. I'm seeing file number, block number from p dollar bh, and uh, where object ID actually this object ID is not object ID; it's actually data object ID because uh, it's normal player right there. And from here, I also saw saw something called lock element address, and what kind of block is this? So in the p dollar bh, there's a class number that shows what kind of block is this. Unfortunately, there is no decode statement there, so I had to decode it myself. All right, I'm going to do that. I got three blocks of this, actually three buffers of this block. Well, what is it? We got data block, data block, segment header. I'm not going to talk about it. Okay, and each block has uh, the status is exclusive current, as you can see here. Why exclusive current? Remember, we did an insert statement. So it had to do an exclusive current at this time. Segment header, of course, is updated at the time. So 90233, segment header, exclusive current. And uh, other one are data blocks, 90234, 235. At the time, this instance has three. Let's ignore for the time segment header because that's not really important. Segment, the data blocks are important to us. 234 and 235, and we have exclusive current copy. The lock element simply says, what lock element, uh, what kind of lock is on that, and what which lock element is used to lock that buffer. If you ever want to find out which lock element this is, you can go and, and search the X dollar LE, but it's not really element, and lock mode is explosive current attack. Anyway, let's move on to this one. So VBH, the, um, uh, the, the buffer cast thing we're talking about here and a 49 so, so I have on this uh, on this instance number two, I'm sorry, instance number one, we have a copy of the buffer as exclusive current. Let's see on instance two, what do we have? Well, on instance two, I have no row selected. Why is that? Well, it's very simple. Nobody selected, or so there is no buffer of those tables on instance two, and as a result, we couldn't find anything there. All right, so that's that's pretty clear. Now, one more thing I wanted to see here. Let's say 
I do is select from here. Let me do a set echo on so you know exactly what I'm doing. Let me select from some table, from this table where column 1 equal to 2. When you do that, let's see what happens. It's selected from there. Remember, at this time, it gets through cat fusion from instance 1 to instance. When you do that, let me do the VBH, the buffer cast one more time. All right, this is interesting. Now, look at this one. Let's say 90233, the segment header. I got a sad current of this. Why sad current? Because the segment header actually did not change. For a to get segment header from the other instance to see what extent there are and where to find it and what kind of uh, blocks are available and so on and so forth. So to do that, it had to get that on, on a shared current mode, and because that's same across all the instances, and then read from there to read other data. But look at other things. There are a bunch of other CRs as well for the same segment header. Why? What happens is when Oracle gets the data from other instances, it just can't go and grab it. It has to go and request that in a CR mode. Once that copy is retrieved, it has to do some manipulations to convert it into a shared current mode. That is called a CR processing, and that's important. That's why instead of updating the same copy, it actually makes another copy and update that copy. So as a result, you will not have one-to-one -one correspondence between the blocks and the buffers. There will be more than one copy of the buffer in the buffer cache. Look at the other one, data block. The data block was retrieved in CR mode. Why? Because the intention was not to modify. The intention was simply select from it. So it had to get the block from the other side at CR mode. But again, there are two CR modes for each of the data blocks. Why? Because it got the first copy as CR mode. Then it had to do a rate consistency model to provide a second copy of the CR mode and, and return to the end user. There are multiple copies of it. Interesting things here. Lock element. It makes sense to have a shared current because current means a lock. Yeah, that. Look at the lock element here, the CR copy. Remember, there is no locking on the CR. But Oracle doesn't say that there is no locking. It says it's called a null lock. N-U-L-L, null. A null lock is generally used as a 0, 0 on the lock element side. So it first got that from here. Let's see what is the impact on instance 1 side. All right, instance 1. The only difference was the segment header used to be exclusive current earlier. Now it becomes a shared current. Why? Makes sense. Remember, it cannot be exclusive current on one side and shared current on the other side. If it is exclusive current, it has to be exclusive current only. And everybody else has to be either PI or CR. They cannot be shared current. If there is shared current, they have to be shared current across all instances. So in this case, instance 1 had to downgrade it to said current. So instance 2 could upgrade it to said current. So now segment header is identical across both the instances, and that is similar to what we have on the desk. That's why the said current and all are there. And the other two data blocks is still exclusive current because they are the exclusive current one. So it makes no sense not to do anything with that. All right, that is the case. Let's do a simple operation. Let me do an update here update on the instance 2. And I'm updating row number 2 here. When I do that, let's see what happens. PBH. When I do that, very interesting. First of all, I can see here the data block, in this case, 2234, has become exclusive current. Why? It had to. Because it's, I'm, at this point, I'm updating it. I'm not I'm not just selecting from it, I'm updating it. If I'm updating it, it has to become an exclusive current copy of it. Only then you can update the buffer. When you do that, what happens in instance one? There used to be exclusive current earlier. Instance one, maybe the two, three, four. It's a database ID here. That becomes a CR copy, as you can see here. So it cannot be exclusive current on the side. It has to be a CR copy. 
And another interesting thing happened that it, on the 235 it becomes say at current. Why is that? Well, that to answer the question, look at this side too. Hey, I simply updated row number two. Remember, I also selected row number two on instance two side. Row number two who is on block number 234. So why am I getting 235 on instance two as well? It's because there is no index on this table. So when I'm selecting only row number two. I'm actually not just doing that. I'm actually doing a full table scan as well. That's why I got both the blocks from the other side and the, both the blocks are from CR copy. Okay. Similarly, when I do an update statement, same thing happens. Or I have to go and scan all the blocks to find out where the row is. Then what I do is, when I find a row in a buffer, I try to get the exclusive lock on that buffer, which I got, 2, 3, 4. But I don't know if that row is found on block number 235 as well. So I asked for that a CR copy of it. And at that time, this one has to downgrade it. Instance number one has to downgrade it to a set current, hoping that the other instance might find it. If it does not find it, fine. It just goes on and just make a CR copy of it. But at that time, it has to make a exclusive, a, I'm sorry, a set current at this time. Okay. So we got a CR copy here and one exclusive current copy on 234 here. So that is clear now. So this is, there used to be 0, 0 here. Now we have an exclusive current copy of it. Now you can also see 234 has multiple CR copies. CR, CR, CR copies and one copy is exclusive current copy. On this side, the, the exclusive current copy we had before was downgraded to CR copy. And the, after the downgrade happened, it was sent over to the other side which is instance two. Instance two applied something called a CF processing to make it uh, to consistent at that point in time and return to the end user. And it becomes CF copy here, exclusive current copy here. Now, let me do this. Let me do an update on instance one now. And updating a different row, remember? Why? Because the row lock on instance, uh, on, on row number two will not, will, will prevent me from updating the row two again. So I'm updating a different row now, column one, very different row. And if I do this, uh, what is the object ID again? Uh, keep forgetting. Edge row four eight nine. Ah, let's look at that. Two three four. Now two three four has got exclusive current. It used to be CR earlier. Now exclusive current. What happens here? Now, <coughs> excuse me, 920234 has become a PI copy. Why PI copy? Remember, the checkpoint that hasn't happened yet. As a result, it could downgrade to CI copy, but in that case, instance recovery will take a lot of much in a longer time. So instead of doing it CI copy, it converts to a PI copy and sends across to the other instance. And this instance got an exclusive correct copy. Now, this got downgraded on instance 2, instance 1 got upgraded. In the, on that buffer, 90234. Update happened here. Let's see, I do another update on instance 2 now, but a different row. Okay? VVH. Now look at that. Now it got an exclusive current copy one more time. We have PI copy and exclusive current copy on this side, interestingly, I got a PI copy as well. Why PI copy? Remember, checkpoint hasn't happened yet. So, instance one, before it sends out the buffer, it has to convert it to a PI copy and send out to the other side. On the other side, it gets that copy and upgrades to exclusive current copy. This is how the back and forth, back and forth happens between the two instances. And this is very important. And to understand the concept, because every time you are updating a buffer, you are requesting the lock upgrade. And the other side has to do a lock downgrade. And this lock upgrade and downgrade is Q best. And this Q is on a, the master level. And to find the master, you can use this. Okay. 
your script. And please don't run the script on your production database because it's very expensive. So in this case, master node is zero. That means the first node uh, starts with zero. So nine zero two three four two two three and two three four five is my master node. Is that? That's the first node. So it has to go and grab the master from the all the, from that instance only. All right. So let's do checkpoint. All this is done. checkpoint. Remember, I, this is checkpoint is a local checkpoint by de default. It's not a global checkpoint. So I'm doing a checkpoint on instance one. Let's see what happens to the copy we have on instance two. Now there used to be a PI copy here, and of course there's a PI copy on instance one as well here. So let's see what will happen to both of them. All right, system altered. Um, DBH one more time. So, uh, Sorry, N0489. Look at the copy. Where is the PA copy now? It's gone. Now it's called CR copy. Makes sense because when you do a auto system checkpoint, at that time, the buffer on the buffer cache and on the disk are identical. Instance recovery will not, there's no need to have a PI copy. Whereas on, well, that's Next says on instance one, but the checkpoint didn't happen on instance two. So what will happen to PI copy there? Hmm. The PI copy is also gone. There's no PI copy anymore. Why is that the case? Remember, instance one, when the when the checkpoint actually happens, at that time, the copy on instance one is identical to the copy on the disk. In instance two, if it crosses, well, the copy on the buffer cache is gone anyway, right? If the instance crosses, the buffer cache of instance two is gone anyway. So what is the point of a PI copy? It's useless at the time. So Oracle discards the PI copy or actually converts into a CR copy. And as a result, the lock element is gone. Okay, so what do you understand from all this? You understand how exactly the back and forth happens, how the the exclusive current copy of the buffer is retrieved because it intends to modify something. And you saw how it went back and forth. Someone has to be a master of the buffer where it maintains information on who has the exclusive current copy, shared current copy, and so on. When an instance wants to modify the buffer, it has to go and grab the exclusive current lock on the buffer, but it just can go and grab it. It has to go and request the global MQ service, hey, go give me the grant, exclusive current grant. As a result of doing that, some if somebody else has that exclusive current grant, it has to be downgraded to a CR copy or a shared current or a PI or whatever it was after requirement at the time is, and so that instance can go and grab it. <coughs> and that happens under master instance for the buffer. And the master instance actually is across all the instances of the, of the, of the cluster, not just one instance. Remember, <coughs> all the buffers of one segment are mastered at one instance. And if they're spread across all the clusters in such a way, they're, they're pretty much, um, all the instances are pretty much equal number of buffers to be mastered. But the master gets the request all the time. If you attended my webcast about two weeks ago on that, um, on uh, <coughs> excuse me, rack performance tuning, that was very, uh, I, I talked about uh, CR block two-way, CR grant two-way. This is exactly what happens, CR grant two-way. If an instance requests it to the other instance, hey, grant print, the wait time it encountered in the process is the current grant to it to get that grant back to it. Similarly, well, if the instance says sure, but I am no, I'm the master, but I don't have the most current copy of the block, so you have to go and grant give it to uh, instance number three. At that time, <coughs> excuse me, uh, it has to go and grab the block from the other instance number three. That's called this is 
got a block three way, as you can saw it there. So if you uh, attended that session, I hope you understand now how the locking structure actually happened. So with that said, and hopefully this will all be clear in my demonstration. And that said, I will uh, wrap it up. On the second place, somehow it's not coming up. Uh, okay, good. So in summary, Bob has gotten in two modes. Current mode, if it needs to be modified. CR mode, if it is selected only for raining. Every time one node wants a buffer, it is copied to a new buffer and sent across using called CR processing. As a result of that, you have more number of buffers than we have a number of blocks in the database. So to answer the original question, if I have a 500 meg database and a 500 meg buffer cache, can I fit my entire database into buffer cache? Answer is no, you saw that. By the way, we saw a CR copy, multiple CR copies. How many like that? Well, it's going to flood the entire buffer cache. To do that, Oracle actually puts a limit on that. It's six number, exact six. Not more than six CR copies of the buffer will, will be there. If the, if the seventh copy is ever requested to be created, Oracle has to remove one of the CR copies, all the CR copies out of the buffer cache to make room for the sixth one, or the seventh one. There can be only one current state of the buffer in the instance of the sad mode. But if it is exclusive current, there can be only one exclusive current in the entire cluster. And if something is in say exclusive current mode, there cannot be anything in shared current mode. This exclusive shared current locks in the buffer is handled by a process by a component of rack called global NQ services. Global NQ services, which is very, very different from locking. With a row level locking, you might have seen a single instance as well. Each buffer also called a resource in rack has a master node that holds the lock grant and convert queues I mean which instance has the uh, what kind of lock and everybody has to go to the master to grant a uh, request lock and, and grant a lock GID is the component that maintains the information on which buffers are mastered in which instance and this GID component is actually replicated across all the instances of the rack cluster so thank you very much you can actually download all the scripts I use here from this website I mentioned here. And uh, you can visit my blog if you haven't. I also have, I will also put the scripts there as well. And if there is a question, you're very welcome to uh, email me or send me a blog. And like everything else, I really appreciate your feedback, how you liked it and all that. With that said, I will open up for questions. Anyone have any question? Okay, I hope looks like there's no questions today. And our, if the, anyone have any question, please feel free to uh, ask Arup directly or send me an email to me, and I will be more than glad to send that to Arup. Arup, thank you for your time. Thank you for the big favor to be doing this webinar, Sikh, and from India. And I see you around. Thank you so much, Arup. Great, thank you. Thank you, Francisco. I'll see you now. Thanks, Mark. Bye-bye.